Cyberpunk 2077 sucks. No, wait, now it's good. Oh crap, nope, still bad. Uh, wait a minute. It's gonna take at least another generation before the discussion surrounding Cyberpunk 2077 will go past the mess of a release this game had. Bugs, crashes, unfulfilled promises, and a general distrust towards its developer CD Projekt Red still models any kind of conversation about this game to this day. Yet, here's the thing. You can criticize CD Projekt Red's upper management for lying to customers and their own shareholders while still playing, critiquing and appreciating Cyberpunk 2077 for its own merits and flaws. And with the recent release of the Phantom Liberty expansion, now it's as good a time as it'll ever be for me to talk about this damn thing. And for my money... Mm, that's a 10. Time to party like it's 2023. Spoiler! Zone. On a surface level, Cyberpunk 2077 isn't that different from other open world games. A gigantic map full of empty areas, icons scattered around, go there, shoot some dudes, get the money, buy a cool car, bye boy So why did I love it so much? As my good old friend Taika Waititi says, good writing goes a long way. V, the mercenary who wants to become a night city legend, has her entire life turned upside down when her last gig goes south, her best friend dies, she gets a bullet to the brain, and when she wakes up she finds out that not only she's gonna die again in a matter of weeks, but also that the chip she stole and planted into her synapses contains the digital construct of the late rockstar turned terrorist Johnny Silverhand, now stuck in her mind and destined to overwrite her consciousness. Also, I will refer to V as female because A, I vastly prefer the female voice acting, and B, because I couldn't find a penis size in the character editor that would match mine. It's a twist on the body cop story. V and Johnny have to learn to cooperate in order for V to find a cure, yet they understand that they're intrinsically in competition. If V finds a way to remove Johnny's construct, there's a good chance he'll die. But I can't do dick. But if V can succeed, it's Johnny who's gonna get a brand new body for himself. Strange impression your comatose self wanted to get rid of me. The events of the story are largely irrelevant. The real meat is in its characters, and so much attention to detail has been poured into making each and every one of them. Takemura, Misty, Jackie, Delamain, Ro, this young funny lady in an old motel. Oh shit, you ain't with the cops, are ya? All of them create a larger tapestry that gives both V and Johnny a chance to reflect on their respective lives and grow as a person. For V, this is a coming-of-age story, one that sees her trying to overcome the death of her friend and the hopelessness of her situation, and in the little time she has left, she'll have to make decisions that will shape what kind of person she is. On the other hand, Johnny went out of this world on his terms, but waking up decades later, he finds out that instead of leaving a mark on the history books, he left a blood trail of broken lives, remorseful friends, and the realization that all he did was for nothing. However, and hear me out on this, this is not a cyberpunk story. I don't know what you mean. I may not be an expert in the subject, but in my opinion, the cyberpunk elements in this plot are nothing more than background fluff. Transhumanism, mega corporations, tyrannical control, the risk of the cyberspace, AIs. These are all elements that are featured in the plot, but they're never a core theme. Like, for example, Johnny's quest for revenge against Arasaka, the corporation that killed him. Is part of his character arc, sure, but you can replace Arasaka with anything else and the story would still work just fine. Or again, the few times that V and Johnny discuss the implications of what it means for a digital construct to have its own life and consciousness, Johnny cuts the discussion short every single time. Whether it's because he genuinely doesn't care or because he's afraid of the answer, it's up to interpretation. Hell, in one of the endings, V is turned into a digital construct herself, just like Johnny, yet instead of spiraling into paranoia, wondering whether she's still the real V or if she's just a copy of a dead woman, she moves on very fast. Wait, hold on. I want to know what the hell happened to me. I applied Soul Killer to separating your two psyches. Twelve seconds later. So that's really it. We're done. You're awful calm about it. 
Ironically, it's the Cyberpunk 2077's anime that feels a lot more cyberpunk. The story of David Martinez starts off in a similar vein as V's, but the driving force of this plot is the abuse David makes of cybernetic augmentations, turning him into a man driven by a lust for power and revenge, ultimately making him less of a human being and more of a giant mech. A grotesque transformation, not too dissimilar from the one we see in 1988's Acura. This is transhumanism, new and crude. That said, does it mean that the cyberpunk stuff in Cyberpunk 2077 is just window dressing used to make things more shiny? Not really, it's just that all this is not in the story, it's in the city. Night City is a towering megalopolis, beautifully crafted and at first glance does look majestic, alluring, yet it's also so incredibly suffocating. Skyscrapers and highways cover the sky, the neon lights violently blind us, divide advertisements blast from every speaker and billboard, gang violence is widespread, mega corporations take advantage of the poorer districts of the town. If you listen to the dialogues of random NPCs, you can pick up some truly disturbing stuff. This is what I heard in front of a school in the Santo Domingo area. Yeah, there's a school in this game. Surprise! What's your point? I'm offering you the unique opportunity to join the Power to the Pupil program. We'll equip your students with the latest Militech implants. And what do teachers get out of it? I'm so glad you asked, and you'll get paid. Now we're talking. All these elements serve as a background for the side quest you complete. That's where the cyberpunk elements really shine. You've got one of my favorite quests, Dream On. You meet the Paralysis here, a couple of politicians who are being brainwashed, their personality completely overridden, turned into puppets by an unknown organization. Or maybe it's an AI. We never know. In another one you discover an underground market where kids are artificially turned into the next sports stars and sold to talent scouts. Brothels either abuse or sell away their workers as soon as their brain chips start malfunctioning. Night City is a dangerous, rotten town. A dog-eat-dog -dog world that has no mercy for those who show weakness. For people like V though, it's a city full of opportunities. So what? I'm supposed to blow my fucking brains out? Good idea, you'd be saving me, lad. Very fucking funny. <sighs> Grab a gun and try to always be on top, and that's your road to success. The marketing, after all, constantly referred to Night City as City of Dreams. What people seem to forget, though, is the fact that dreams only appear when you sleep, and in Night City, you're not always lucky enough to wake up. Probably in a sleep. A peaceful death in this town? Guy won the jackpot. That's the key element of the entire plot of Cyberpunk 2077. The unifying theme that links V's story with the cyberpunk hellscape of the town. Death. Everybody fucked in the ass. Nothing survives in Night City. At the lower end of the social ladder, people deal with poverty, illness, and cyberpsychosis induced by the augmentations they are forced to implant in order to keep their working class jobs. At the top of the hierarchy, you live a more comfortable life, but you also spend every waking moment with a crosser pointed at your head. Jesus, Saburo Arasaka, the head of one of the most powerful corporations in the world, shows up after god knows how long in town and is immediately killed after a few minutes. At the ripe age of 158, so you know, not that bad. Even the local fauna has gone completely extinct, leaving space for metal, concrete and blood to fester. Fine looking feline. Thought they'd all disappeared from the city. It is the first animal I see in Night City, except cockroaches, of course. If you're lucky, your body will rot in a fridge. If you're not, you're going to just be another cog in the machine, your spirit and hope crushed to the ground. Death is the driving force in most quests. 
You accept this gig to be a driver in a few car races, but really the quest giver only plans to take revenge on an old rival who caused the death of her husband. In Sinner Man, a convict decides to pay for his crimes by filming a movie where he will be crucified, convinced that his action will give new hope to people, yet we can see that his death is just going to be an easy to sell product for the studio who's recording it. Takemura, the disgraced corporal bodyguard who grew up in the slums with whom V teams up, might be alive, but his spirit is dead and withered. He is loyal to a fault, to the same corporation that created the inequality he suffered since birth, then took him in as a child, trained to be a soldier and then still discarded like damaged goods at the first chance they got. Hell, even the funny story about Brandon, the sentient soda machine, ultimately ends with him being decommissioned. And what I'm saying is clearly a sentiment shared by the ultra-rich people in town. After all, the relic, the chip that contains Johnny's construct, is revealed to be a tool to achieve immortality. Save your digital self in an engram and replace the consciousness of someone else with your own. You might think that the people who live outside the city, the nomads that populate the badlands, might have it better. And at first, it does look like it. It's quiet. The hum of the city and people's voices. It's all gone. But no. Night City is nothing short of a cancer. What you're left with is a no man's land, arid and hostile. A dump where Night City regurgitates all its trash. You don't go to Night City for a better life. Yet it seems that only one group of people realizes it. Mercenaries, like V. Think about it. Their hub is the bar after life. You're considered a legend your name used on the menu, only if you die in spectacular fashion while on the job. They take risky jobs knowing that each one of them can easily be their last. And then there are V and Johnny. They're the only ones in town who get to see what's the reward for this life, what it means to be a legend. Nothing. Their names? Just tales shared in front of a beer. If anything, all that awaits V now is something even worse. Her own sense of self slowly merging with Johnny's until she will just cease to exist. Honestly, I'm scared of the day I'll start seeing your memories as my own. You're more like me than you think. I feel like the real turning point of this duo's arc is during the chipping in side quest, near the end of the game. This is the moment where Johnny realizes that his lifelong fixation with corporations was a waste of his time that only brought suffering upon others. And V? Well, V gets to find a friend in him. Of all the heads I could have popped up in, hella glad it was yours. The ending is, for all accounts, a suicide mission, but it's not driven by the desire of becoming a legend, nor by the hatred towards Arasaka. It's just pure will to live. This is why I think that only two of the five available endings really make sense. The Temperance and the Star endings. As we reach the end of our journey, either V or Johnny will end up getting control of V's body, while the other one will be left into the cyberspace, turning into an AI destined to be something different, far from human. If we instead follow one of the other endings, the Tower, Devil or Sun, what awaits us is just death, in different flavors. In the tower, V will wake up from a coma after two years, all her friends having forgotten her, her life as a mercenary reaching an abrupt end, and Johnny being completely erased from existence. In the devil, Johnny is again deleted, but this time V isn't even really cured and she can ultimately accept one last deal with Arazaka, becoming one of their construct and hope that they'll find a body for her in the future. But with the devil, get it? Get it? The sun is a bit better. V becomes a legendary merc, but what really happens is that she gives in to Night City's temptations. She turns into this dark devil mercenary, ready to take any job and sacrifice all her relationships because she knows that she's got only a few months left to live. But in the Temperance and Star endings, either V or Johnny will leave Night City. The answer was always there. Night City is just a big fleshy toy, a sandbox where you can have the craziest highs and the lowest lows. But nothing there is made to last. You die in Night City or live far away from it.
Would you take a bullet for me? I would. Yeah. Test of a person's true value? Death. I'll see you around, John. Good night, Valerie. Today was a good day. Leaving Night City is the only way for these two characters to find meaning in their life, to go somewhere distant, somewhere where they can find all the things they really needed. Minus the charisma, an impressive cop.